Savannah. Savannah is the first planned city in America. When I say planned, it was actually planned out before the colonists even arrived here. They had the blueprints in their pockets. It was founded by General James Oglethorpe in 1732, or excuse me, 1733. He and 128 other colonists jumped on board a sailing ship in November 1732. It took them 88 days to cross the Atlantic Ocean, landing here in Savannah in February. They actually landed just to our left there, right in front of the uh, Hyatt Regency Hotel. There's a placard on the uh, brick plaza marking precisely where he landed. When he arrived here, this area was already occupied. It was occupied by a group of Native Americans called the Yamacraw tribe. The Yamacraws were led by Chief Tamachichi. And despite most of the history between uh, Americans and Native Americans, this relationship was actually a very positive relationship. Uh, James Oglethorpe and their Chief Tamachichi got along very well. They saw a lot of value in having a good working relationship, a lot of opportunities for trade, and a lot of knowledge and technology that could be shared between the two groups. So it was a very positive relationship. So there was a couple of reasons for forming Savannah. Uh, number one was England was ever expanding at the time with more and more colonies. Uh, much like Australia was going to be England's prison colony, Savannah and Georgia was going to be uh, England's debtors colony. In the 1700s, if you acquired too much debt, instead of just getting more and more credit card offers in the mail, they would actually make you pay it back. And if you couldn't pay it back, they put you in jail. So there was a lot of these debtor pr debtors prisons, and prison was uh, no place to be in the 1700s, had a very high mortality rate. So they started sending the debtors over here to Georgia. They sent about 10,000 debtors in the first year alone. They gave them a plot of land and about one year's worth of provisions to get stuff started. The other reason for Savannah was we were going to be a defensive city. If you've been around our city, you've noticed it's laid out in a perfect grid. That is not on accident. Savannah was actually designed to be a fortified city. If we were to get attacked, or if England, uh, the English colony was to get attacked by Spain in the 1700s, the city of Savannah could have been turned into a defensive fort very quickly. That's why it's laid out in a perfect grid, and that's why it's got 22 squares in it. It was all part of a strategy to defend the port of Charleston from the Spanish in the event of an invasion. So Charleston used to be a much more valuable port than the port of Savannah. It's this nice wide open harbor. It was very easy for the sailing ships of the day to sail in and out of the harbor. Unlike the Savannah River, which is 14 miles behind us, it changes direction twice a day with the tides. So back in those sailing days, it was much easier to get in the port of Savannah, and that was the English's uh, most valuable port on the southeast coast. So Savannah was going to be here to defend it, and it was going to be here as a debtor's colony. Since then, Savannah has grown uh, quite significantly in the uh, shipping industry, especially since the age of steam, when vessels started being able to make their way up and down the Savannah River. Uh, so today, Savannah is actually the third busiest port here in the United States. Uh, Los Angeles, Long Beach uh, is number one, Newark, New Jersey is number two, and Savannah is the third busiest port. We're actually the number one port for exports. More goods leave the port of Savannah than any other port in America. So there's a very strategic reason why so much leaves the port of Savannah, but the main reason is it's our geography. We are actually the furthest west on the East Coast. So again, we're further west than anybody else on the East Coast. So all these guys that are manufacturing goods here in America, it costs them less money in shipping to get their goods to Savannah than say places like Charleston, Norfolk, or Wilmington. It's just much more better for uh, their bottom line at the end of the day. So geography, like I said, we're the furthest west on the east coast. We're actually due south of Cleveland, Ohio. We serve a 27 state region in the port of Savannah, and our daily uh, local economic impact is around $100 million every single day. That's right, our little tiny city of Savannah, the port of Savannah, has an economic impact of $100 million every single day. So in this month alone, we're expected to see about 400,000 containers, basically like the size of the back of a semi-truck, come through our port. So we're a very busy port. If you've been on River Street today, you've seen some of these gigantic ships that make their way in and out of the Port of Savannah. These ships are so large, they're capable of carrying about 15,000 containers on a single ship. So to put that in perspective, what 15,000 uh, semi-trucks lined up all on one ship. This is such an economic way to send goods around the world. It's determined, it only costs about uh, 22 cents per unit to send a television that's manufactured in China here to the United States. 
So about half the price of a stamp to get a television all the way from China here to our shores. It costs about five times as much to get it on the back of a truck and get it to the stores where the retailers are selling it. So as you guys feel the shade come across the top deck here, we're going underneath the Eugene Talmadge Memorial Bridge, and we're getting into a very industrial part of the Savannah River. Now the Savannah River has always been industrial. This is a tidal river, basically salt water affects about 18 miles of this river here. So the land on either side is not good for farming. So there's never been any of the farms, the plantations, the mansions on this section of the river. It has always been industrial in this area. So a little bit of our shipping can be seen off the left side, the port side of the vessel right now. Uh, this is Steamship Terminal 1 and 2. So usually the types of vessels that dock here are called row rows, which that's kind of short for roll on, roll off. These are essentially floating parking garages. They usually have about 10 or 12 different decks. They're built like a parking garage with just continuous ramps driving all the way up. So almost everything they're shipping on these vessels can be driven on or off of the boat. So right here you can see a lot of heavy industrial equipment made by Volvo, JCB, and Caterpillar. All these companies have plants here in the southeast. And again, due to our geography, it's just cheaper for them to get their goods into the Port of Savannah than other ports. They elect to ship their goods out of our port. Other stuff that leaves this terminal, probably the most frequent thing that leaves this terminal here is automobile. So we export a lot of automobiles out of the Port of Savannah. But it's not the brands you think we would be exporting from uh, from Georgia here. It's not Chrysler, Ford, Chevy, on, Jeep, those ones. We're actually exporting foreign named cars like Mercedes-Benz, BMW, Nissan, uh, Kia. Uh, these cars are all these companies all have plants here in the southeast, and they export these. Uh, or they bring their vehicles here to Savannah to be exported all over the world. So other types of boats that we see in here, we see the row rows that I just described. We won't see one today. If you hang out on River Street enough, you'll see uh, some of these container ships that come into the port of Savannah. So these container ships are the largest ships in the world. They're about four city blocks long. They go underneath the water about 40 feet. They go up in the air about 185 feet. So these are the largest ships in the world. So up until about four years ago, the largest ships were usually around a thousand feet long, but four years ago, the new locks in the Panama Canal opened, allowing for larger and larger ships to see them. And now Savannah can accommodate these larger ships. So besides uh, those two types of vessels, we also see a type of vessel called a brake bulk carrier, which carries like loose or bulk items. We'll actually pass one of those a little bit further down the river today. And then the last type of vessel we get in here are called tankers. So tankers usually carry different types of uh, liquid cargo with them. The number one uh, our port. So the Port of Savannah is constantly growing. We actually have a 20 year uh, growth plan in place right now. Uh, we are constantly developing. In fact, off the left side of the vehicle, the port side, you can see a uh, terminal with a lot of containers and cranes in there. Actually, just about six months ago, that was just a field. That actually is a brand new development. That's our newest container ship terminal. Um, and at this point, we're going to get turned around. Uh, we're not going to go all the way up into the Garden City Terminal. There's one of the main reasons we're getting turned around right now is because of some other industry here on the Savannah River. The big one is the International Paper Paper Mill. I don't know how many of you guys have been up next to a paper mill, but it doesn't smell very good. So this is generally our spot to get turned around. Uh, it's kind of hard to see the International Paper Mill, but you can see some of the smokestacks there on the Georgia side sticking up into the air. So this, uh, you know, paper mill doesn't seem, it's got a couple of cool things going for it. So the International Paper Mill, owned by International Paper, is actually one of the largest land owners in the United States. The reason they own so much land is they actually grow most of the trees that they use for, for producing paper. They're actually constantly replanting pine trees in order to have enough uh, trees that they don't are just like, just tearing apart forest day after day. It's actually grown just like corn or any other crop that might be grown. Their crop just base. The width of the river is not actually a factor. The river is plenty wide for these large ships to pass by each other. But the two factors are the depth of the river and the height of our bridge. So when James Oglethorpe arrived in Savannah back in 1733, the average depth of the river right here was only 10 feet deep. Uh, we've been dredging this river a lot over the years. If you don't know what dredging is, that's basically scooping up the mud off the bottom of the river and putting it elsewhere. 
and for a lot of years that elsewhere was right over here on Hutchinson Island. So right here, this island here didn't always look like this. This used to be a bunch of low-lying marshlands at high tide, most of it would disappear. Our tide here is about eight to 10 feet, depending on the lunar phase of the moon. So that means our water rises and lowers about 14 inches every single hour. It's a pretty extreme tide here for the East Coast. So over the years that dredge material was put over here on Hutchinson Island, building it up to what you see right now. So our average depth here in this area is now about 47 feet deep. We've basically made this water 37 feet deeper. But the other fact that we face with the getting ships in and out is our bridge here. They are getting too tall for our current bridge. And this is a, isn't actually the first time this happened. If you look to the left side or the right side here, you'll see the stanchions of the former Eugene Talmadge Memorial Bridge that was built in the 1950s. So this bridge had a clearance of about 135 feet, which was fine for ships of the day. Until 1981, that's when the first vessel struck the underside of it. And then two more hit the underside of it. And so Savannah had to make a decision. It was get a bigger bridge or get out of the shipping industry. So they redesigned a new bridge. This bridge was completed back in 1991. In 1991 money, this cost about $72 million to build. But as ships are getting bigger, no longer is our river deep enough. No longer is our bridge tall enough. So currently there are two projects going on to make us more easily accommodate these large ships. The first one is to dredge the river five feet deeper. This is gonna cost about $1 billion to make the water five feet deeper. The bridge is no longer tall enough. So to build a bigger bridge, it's gonna cost about $2 billion. So we've got $3 billion in projects for infrastructure for the Port of Savannah happening. But again, currently we have an economic impact of $100 million every day, and we plan on growing that because when these ships are stuck at the dock, they're not making money. When they're stuck at the dock, we can't get a new ship on the dock, so we're not making money. So by making the river deeper and making the bridge taller, we're gonna get ships in and out of here faster. So the study done has determined that every dollar we spend on infrastructure for the Port of Savannah, we should see $7 in return. So our $1 billion dredging project should yield about $7 billion in economic impact, and our $2 billion bridge should yield about $14 billion in economic impact. <laughs> All right, guys, so off the right side, we got our first little bit of history here. Um, this uh, doesn't look too historical. This is actually Ocean Terminals 1 and 2. These are the oldest commercial docks in Savannah. They opened up in 1818, and this is what shipping used to look like. Low-lying warehouses, of course, it wasn't the steel material. It was wood back in the 1800s. But the historic thing that happened out of here was one year later in 1819, the steamship Savannah dropped its line, left here, and went across the Atlantic Ocean. This was the first vessel to ever cross the Atlantic Ocean under power. Until then, all the crossings had been done with sails. So uh, the Savannah was originally built as a sailboat, as a square rigger. They added paddle wheels to it, not like our one big paddle wheel, but one on the left and the right side on the port and starboard side. And they had a steam boiler for power. The problem was they had to carry so much fuel and their boiler was so big, they could no longer carry enough cargo to make a profit. So they only remained a steamship for three years and then they finally tore the boiler out, they tore the paddle wheels off, went back to being strictly a power boat and they continued to operate for many years for profit. It wasn't until 33 years after that that another steamship crossed the Atlantic Ocean. That's how far ahead of its time it was. So that was uh, in the early 1800s. Uh, off our right side, going a little bit later to the late 1800s, the 1890s, this was the site of Savannah's first power plant. There's really nothing remaining of that power plant, but then in 1909, Plant Riverside here opened up, and this was Savannah's chief source of power until 2005. The brick structure you see here, this was originally a coal burning power plant, and then in the 50s it became a natural gas burning power plant, that's what the gray structure is there. And then in 2005, Plant Savannah opened up, which is a few miles inland, it's a nuclear power plant that we get all of our power from, and so this was taken offline. But it was determined that with this much infrastructure, this close to the river, would cost more to remove the building than to build a new one in its place. So they decided to repurpose the building. So they redesigned it. It actually just opened up a few months ago. This is the JW Marriott Hotel, but it's a lot more than a hotel. It's considered Savannah's new entertainment district. Some of the cool stuff going on here is their new construction, this first building furthest to the right. It's gonna have a 1,500 person amphitheater on the rooftop for concerts and things like that. 
inside of there, especially as this heat builds, you definitely want to check it out. It's like a museum that doesn't charge admission. They got a lot of really high-end, incredible pieces of artwork in there. They've got dinosaur bones and artifacts. They got petrified wood, a lot of geological stuff to see, like uh, gems and geodes and things like that. So definitely, like, if you want to get out of the sun after this trip and just feel some air conditioning, check out some cool stuff. Definitely check out Plant Riverside. For those of you that are adults, they do have a lot of uh, rooftop bars there as well. They have three different rooftop bars. And if you like to combine playground equipment with uh, your drinking, one of the bars has a slide for an exit. So definitely worth checking out while you're here. All right, before we get too far, we got a couple of interesting buildings here with all the stonework. Those are Savannah's oldest masonry building with the multicolored rocks right there. Those buildings were built in 1793. So a pretty big feat to build a four-story building in the 1790s. Amazing that they're still standing in 2021. The interesting thing about all those stones is none of them are native to North America. So when England was sending over ships in the 1700s, they had nothing to send us. We had so many natural resources here, we were only exporting from the Americas. So in order for a sailboat not to tip over, they have to load the bottom full of lots of weight. Well, when they left America, they were full of cargo. This was the weight, that basically the balance of the boat. When they didn't have this cargo in it, they used these stones, and they were called ballast stones. So when these ships arrived from England, they would simply dump all the ballast stones out on the river street, and the colonists discovered they were great for building roads, for building homes, for building that kind of stuff, or much more easy to work with than the local stones that they would find in the ground here. So peeking out from behind the Hyatt Regency Hotel, you can see Savannah City Hall right there, the Gold Dome. Now most cities don't have a gold dome for their ca or for their city hall unless they were once the capital, which Savannah was the capital until 1805. It actually moved five different times before finally settling in Atlanta. So when I say gold dome, I'm not describing what color it is up there. I'm describing the material that you're looking at. That is a 22 karat gold dome right there. All of that gold comes from right here in Georgia. It was mined in a town called Dahlonega, which is just south of the uh, Tennessee border. It was the site of America's first gold rush long before the 49ers went out to uh, San Francisco. So uh, just for reference points, we just passed our dock. For those of you that don't know, we got turned around. We passed our dock. You can see the brick plaza. You can see River Street. And just past River Street there is Savannah's Cotton Exchange, or Factors Walk. So a factor was a cotton broker. It was discovered shortly after the American Revolution how well cotton grew in this area and the industry boomed. Savannah exported more cotton than, than anybody else in the Atlantic region. We were actually number two in the world, but Savannah was such a thriving area. All of the world prices of cotton were based on what Savannah was trading cotton at. So Savannah would be grown on uh, farms throughout the Southeast. You know, it's an unfortunate part of our history, but it's when we got to realize this industry just was basically built on the forced labor on the backs of like involuntary labor. So I really don't have like a good way to like get into that and give that the justification, but it's just something that definitely needs to be addressed with our history here. Uh, the cotton would be grown on the plantation to be brought down to River Street, loaded on the carts, and then hauled up this hill here. And on these bridges that you see between the buildings, the factors, basically your cotton brokers would stand there and they would offer on each cart as it made its way up and down up the hill if they won that particular cart of cotton it would go into their warehouse and these were all cotton warehouses at one point where their cotton gin was inside the cotton gin was invented by Eli Whitney about eight miles from here back in 1793 it was bundled back up sent down chutes onto River Street then it was loaded back on the carts or onto barges and sailboats and sent further down the river to where the river got much deeper and the larger ships could be waiting to export it so that's an old industry in Savannah. One of our newer uh, thriving industries here is film and television. Uh, for film and television, we're number three in the country. Hollywood, number one. Atlanta, thanks to like Tyler Perry and Zombies, they're number two. And then Savannah, Tybee Island is number three. So if any of you guys are Ozarks fans, you'll recognize our other boat, the Savannah River Queen. That was the Big Muddy River Casino boat in season three of Ozarks. The boat you're on is actually the one that blew up at the same of that same episode. It was actually parked over there at the West End. That was not computer generated either. That was actually live pyrotechnics put on the top of the deck right here. But some other film and television here, of course, like going all the way back into the 70s with Burt Reynolds and Gator. That was all filmed here in Savannah. Uh, some more modern stuff was like Forrest Gump. Well, modern for me, I guess. Uh, Forrest Gump at the Chippewa Square. The Midnight and Garden of Good and Evil at Bonaventure Cemetery. And then getting even more modern is like the live action Lady and the Tramp. This was uh, Paris, France for that movie. 
uh, the Peanut Butter Falcon is filmed in this area, the do-over. Um, and then I think um, Devotion is being filmed with this guy named Joe Jonas. I don't know if anybody knows who that is, but he's, I guess, some Disney star. Uh, they're actually currently filming that right now. So a lot of film and television. And then there's a lot of blockbusters that were filmed out here as well that you might not have heard of, like SpongeBob SquarePants, Magic Mike, and a little bit. But that's the headquarters for the Army Corps of Engineers. So this river, we can't basically, it will not naturally stay as deep as it is right now or as wide as it is right now. So it has to be maintained. Basically, we have dredging going on here 365 days a year. It's a never ending operation. So not only to get the river deeper to 47 feet, but just to maintain the depth of the river, because every time it rains somewhere along the Savannah River, all of that rain will carry a lot of sediment and dirt and everything into the river, and the river will eventually, it's trying to fill itself back in. So if any of you saw like the news last week with the Suez Canal with the ship getting stuck, basically if the Army Corps of Engineers did not constantly dredge this river, it would fill back in and ships would start to get stuck here. But something kind of interesting that you wouldn't think is a big deal is happening right now. And dredging is shut down. This is the only other than hurricanes, it never shuts down. So right now, two endangered species are spawning. The blood-nosed sturgeon and the Atlantic sturgeon are swimming up the Savannah River. And it's such a critical habitat for them. Even construction on the new bridge out to Tybee Island has stopped. So these two uh, animals are endangered species, and to help protect them, they've shut down all the dredging so that they can successfully make their way up the river to do spawning. So there's a couple other things we do to help protect fish like that. So as the river gets deeper and deeper, there's less dissolved oxygen at the bottom. Basically, the fish and creatures at the bottom of the ocean are going to suffocate because there's not enough oxygen at the bottom. So the city of Savannah built a plant that pumps in 12,000 pounds of dissolved oxygen into the bottom of the river every single day just so the oxygen levels can stay high enough that these fish are able to breathe the water through their gills and get enough oxygen out to survive.
So when it's time for this vessel to leave the dock, uh, this vessel only has one motor on it. It's a big motor where the cylinders are actually big enough for a human to crawl inside of. Uh, it does have a bow thruster at the front to help it get turned around, but it really can't get up and down the Savannah River or on and off the dock without assistance. So looking off the left side of the boat, the port side of the boat now, you can see some uh, very specialty tugboats there. These are called ship assist tugboats. Uh, these tugboats are very powerful boats. The boat we're on right now, we've got two Cummins diesels. They're about 625 horsepower each for a total of 1,250 horsepower. These tugboats start at around 5,000 horsepower. So they got a lot of power so that they're able to get these ships on and off of the dock as well as turn them around safely in our turning basins. So here off the right side, the starboard side, we do a lot of importing and exporting of loose goods out of this terminal right here. So some of the items that we have out here are uh, the very far back stuff, the white clay. That white clay is actually an additive in your toothpaste to really high calcium. It's also used to make it porcelain, which is like a little bit of salt water, it really pulls that sort of stuff. The very right here, these uh, brown wood piles, that's wood chips. We're actually making up with the next order of wood chips in the United States. What are wood chips good for? Well, in this case, they've been a turkey and grease. They're combined with resin, which is like the glue used to make fiberglass. And then they're compressed together and made into something called particle board. Well, if you've ever bought uh, like lower end furniture from like Walmart or Ikea, that kind of stuff, and it's not made out of lumber, that's particle board. So most of that particle board actually starts as wood chips here. That's actually pine wood chips there. Uh, inside the two domes here, this is compressed wood pellets. Uh, if you've ever had like a wood burning grill or a wood burning stove, that's the compressed wood pellets we're talking about. These ones are getting exported over to North, Northern Europe. Uh, they got a lot of power plants in Germany, Norway, and Sweden that were built for burning coal. They don't want to burn coal there because of environmental reasons, so they've switched their fuel over to the compressed wood pellets. But we do have some charcoal here at this uh, site here, that gray pile right there, that is all charcoal. But that charcoal is not used for burning. That's It's kind of an opposite effect. It's actually the charcoal used in your water filters. That's the ingredient like in your pure water filters and your Brita water filters that gets most of the impurities out of your water there. It doesn't have the same infrastructure here because this is strictly for importing. We don't export any of this material here. This is called gypsum. Gypsum is that sparkly, sandy material you see with the bulldozers driving around on it. This whole system is set up here with three different funnels that drops it all onto conveyor belts where they can pile it up back there. So gypsum, one of those things you might not have heard of, but what it's used in the two big uses for it, one is in concrete. It's an additive to concrete. It makes it a little bit more flexible, so it's not as brittle, so it's not as likely to crack and break apart. But the main thing that's used in is plaster of Paris or drywall. This is basically the building blocks of the uh, drywall or the walls of the inside of your house. It all starts as this material right here. And we import all of that right there because, well, we don't have a very big uh, supply of it here in the United States. We've got some up around the Great Lakes region, but not enough for the entire country that we need. So we import most of this gypsum from South America and over from uh, Africa. All right, so this section of the uh, river here, this is where we start to see a lot of marine life. Like I said, this water is brackish water. It's actually a mix of uh, salt water and fresh water. The tide comes in twice a day, it's actually reversing the direction. So because of that, it's a mixture of uh, creatures that we see here. It's not uncommon to see the American alligators swimming in these waters here. Usually it's more of a juvenile that's been driven out of its territory by a uh, larger, more aggressive male. Uh, as far as like birds and such, yeah, you'll see seagulls, you'll see pelicans, but you'll also see bald eagles in this area. We've got a good population of bald eagles that live in this area. And then as far as uh, creature, other creatures down in the water, if you look along these uh, catwalks here on the right side, you'll see signs that say caution slow manatees. We do get manatees in this area. Not very often, but we do get them. But they like to hang out more on the back river on the other side because there's less traffic and less current. But the number one animal we see in this region, and we've seen them today, is the Atlantic bottlenose dolphin. So that's a very common uh, mammal to see in this area here. So Savannah is an incredible place for viewing dolphins. Uh, they will actually go as far up as the Potomac Bridge hunting food. We have about 50 to 60 dolphins that live in the Savannah area year round. 
but the magic number we're looking for is when our water off Tybee Island hits about 75 degrees and all the migratory fish start coming in, we'll see an influx of about 800 to 1200 dolphins that will remain in between Hilton and Tybee Island, Hilton Head and Tybee Island, pretty much until October. It's just an unbelievable amount of uh, dolphins, so, you know, if you or into sea kayaking or paddle boarding, you can be out there like right, you know, within a few feet of touching the dolphins. But of course, you don't want to touch the dolphins because they're wild animals and it's a like fifty thousand dollar fine. Well, they got dolphins right now. Coming up on the right side is Fort Jackson. This is part of uh, Georgia's Coastal Defense Network here. Fort Jackson, this was built, uh, started in 1808. Uh, the masons that built it could construct 11,000 of those bricks every single day. It's called Savannah Gray Brick. It's actually made from the mud right here off the bottom of the river. They made them right there in those parade grounds. And it took them a total of four years to build Fort Jackson. So it was ready just in time for the War of 1812, which actually never came this far south. Most of that was fought in the uh, Chesapeake Bay and further north off of New England. But nonetheless, we needed our coastal defenses just in case. So besides this, we also have Fort Pulaski at the mouth of the Savannah River. So since Fort Jackson, uh, after the construction of Fort Pulaski, wasn't deemed as necessary, it kind of uh, fell by the wayside. The Army was putting fewer and fewer soldiers here. It was falling more and more into disrepair until eventually there was just one caretaker left in a very dilapidated fort but that didn't stop a lot of history from happening here. So a few years later in 1861, Governor Brown of Georgia organized a regiment of troops to go and capture the fort. Uh, so that the soldiers uh, marched down from Savannah, they arrived at the fort, they knocked on the door, demanded the surrender. Uh, it wasn't an epic battle, no, the fort keeper handed over the key and walked away. And, but uh, nonetheless, Savannah was celebrating, the Confederacy was celebrating, they had a victory on their hands. So this was 1861, and then in 1862, Fort Pulaski at the mouth of the river, uh, it fell into the Union hands. So the Union soldiers showed up with this brand new thing called rifle bore technology. Basically, this was the first time rifles were used in war of some, with uh, gunnery this size. So the uh, Union Army was able to park about a mile and a half from Fort Pulaski and just bombard it for 31 hours where the Confederate troops could only fire their cannons about half the distance back. So this went on for 31 hours till Fort Pulaski fell, it was surrendered. So they decided to refortify Fort Jackson and really start building it up. So they brought in Robert E. Lee, he redesigned the fort, he put 80 cannons on the inside, much like those three cannons you see on top, those are considered 30 pounders. Uh, that's not the size of the cannons, that's the heaviest projectile it could shoot. So I don't know if any of you have gone bowling and picked up like a 20 pound bowling ball. Think about a 30 pound bowling ball being shot out of there. Uh, so they had another 100 cannons surrounding this area. So essentially the Union could not attack Savannah by sea. And uh, for those of you that know a little bit about your Civil War history, or at least have seen the movie Gone with the Wind, you know Savannah was not attacked by sea. It was attacked by Tecumseh Sherman, who started a march in Atlanta, Georgia back in uh, November of 1864. He marched from Atlanta to Augusta to Charleston and eventually made his way here for Savannah. He arrived here in December of 1864, but Savannah didn't want to be like these, all these other towns along the way. So they actually negotiated a surrender with Sherman. He had 65,000 other troops with him. And then part of that uh, surrender of uh, Savannah was to surrender Fort Jackson. The soldiers were given 24 hours to evacuate the fort or they would be attacked. So the soldiers packed up what they could and they fled across the river into South Carolina carrying everything they could, destroying everything they couldn't carry with them. And that was kind of the uh, end of uh, Savannah and the Civil War at that time. So because of the way the battle unfolded at Fort Pulaski, it was determined that these type of brick forts were obsolete. They could be destroyed by modern cannons with uh, not much effort. So basically the fort was shut down by the federal government, but it stayed a part of their property until 1960. In 1960, they sold the fort to a local uh, not-for-profit here called the Coastal Heritage Society. They own a lot of museums around Savannah and they took possession of the fort. They spent 16 years rebuilding the fort